ABC Listen. Podcasts, radio, news, music and more. G'day ABC News Daily listeners. I'm Matt Bevan and I've got a new series that I'm very excited about. In America's last election, I'm looking back at the denial of the 2020 election result and what it tells us about the plan this year. We think Trump won. Absolutely. We think that the election was rigged. Frankly, we did win this election. So you're going to cause riots in the streets. You can find it on ABC Listen. Just search for If You're Listening. There's a new episode every week. More than two and a half years into the war in Ukraine, Russian President Vladimir Putin has gone to an ally for help. Several thousand North Korean troops have arrived in Russia and are expected to join the fight. Today, Russia expert Matthew Sussex from the Centre for European Studies at the ANU on what it means for the war. I'm Sam Hawley on Gadigal land in Sydney. This is ABC News Daily. Matt, there are these videos that are circulating on social media claiming to show North Korean troops in Russia. Just tell me about those videos, first of all. Yes, so the videos uh, purportedly show North Koreans in military bases, basically, behind barbed wire and performing various training drills. Mm. And the the suspicion is that they're from the far east of Russia in Primorsky Krai. Now, this is very, very close to Russia's very short border with North Korea. And what they're doing there seems to be preparing to uh, to take a role in, in combat. Yeah, it's remarkable. And the movement has been confirmed by the US National Security Spokesman John Kirby. He says the US has tracked about 3,000 North Korean troops who were transported by ship from North Korea to Russia. We do not yet know whether these soldiers will enter into combat alongside the Russian military, but this is a certain, certainly a highly concerning probability. After completing training, these soldiers could travel to Western Russia and then engage in combat against the Ukrainian military. The numbers are bouncing around a little bit. Mm. Some say the Ukrainians are suggesting, for instance, that there are about 11,000 that are preparing to to be sent to Ukraine. The South Koreans say that there's about 12,000. Mm-hmm. There, there's, there's some suggestion that there are some special forces involved and also some trainers. As we know, of course, uh, North Korea has been helping Russia out militarily and, uh, and to use its own kit, often you need people to, uh, to help explain uh, how to use that. And not only that, Matt, I would have thought there would have been a language barrier. Oh, that's absolutely right. So, um, look, you will have some who can speak Russian. Russian is one of the more common uh, languages for North Koreans to learn if they're officers particularly. So Mm. some will have some some Russian language capability, uh, but a lot are not going to be able to communicate with Russians, which which kind of raises, I guess, some questions uh, about precisely how useful they will be and the types of jobs that they're going to be doing. Mm, So do we know for sure that they will be heading to the Russian front line? Look, I think it's most likely that they will. Mm -hmm. Um, It may be that they are used mainly in a sort of rear area type of capacity. So, you know, digging tank traps and trenches and so forth, which would in and of itself free up soldiers, Russian soldiers, that can be then sent into directly into the fighting. So my guess would be that in the first instance, the North Koreans will will be just sort of rear area, but uh, as they become required, and particularly with the if, if the numbers are right, particularly if this is, you know, 11, 12,000 people, you, you'd have to assume that they would be doing at least some of the fighting at some point. Yeah, some reports even suggest they'll be wearing the Russian uniform. What's the Ukrainian leader Vladimir Zelensky had to say about this? 
Well, Zelensky says that that this is a uh, a massive escalation, mm. and uh, and I think he's absolutely right. It is obvious that Putin fears peace, which is why he is looking for ways to escalate the aggression and involve North Korea on the front line. This is an obvious signal to the whole world as to who wants nothing but war. What you've got is a a country in Asia that is sending troops to potentially fight in Europe. This is not something we've really seen before. So for Zelensky, this is uh, this is more of a problem, of course, because it uh, allows more Russians to uh, to get to the front to do the fighting, when in fact the losses projected and uh, and estimated uh, of Russian military personnel have really been quite high. So this is a kind of way around the um, the difficulties of mobilisation that Putin has felt. Yeah, I, I was going to say, presumably we read into this, Matt, that the Russian forces needed backup, that the Russian leader Vladimir Putin's gone to his very close ally Kim Jong-un who's obviously supported the war in Ukraine from the beginning and asked or begged for help. Yes, that's right. And, uh, you know, he's he's obviously you know, extended what he's asked for beyond things like military hardware, so artillery ammunition and some fairly rudimentary North Korean cruise missiles, and is, is now saying we want people. And, and the reason for that is that Putin is quite aware that if the mobilisation call-ups start uh, really honing in on places where there is real political power in Russia, places like Moscow and St. Petersburg, then sentiment against the war might turn very, very badly towards him. At the moment, it's it's a sort of war being fought by people from Russians, Russia's regions, mm. Chechens, Dagestanis, Kalmyks, Tuvans and so forth. But the question is, I guess, you know, what, what is North Korea getting in return? Let's turn to that now then, Matt. What is in it from the North Korean perspective? It has a huge military, we know that, but it hasn't actually fought in a major conflict since the Korean War, has it? No, it's, it's got over a million soldiers, but they don't generally go anywhere. They, uh, they stay close to home because the regime in Pyongyang is, is, is you know, uh, obsessed with the question of reunification and fearful that the South Koreans will, will invade and try and take, uh, take North Korea over and uh, topple the regime. Or, uh, at other times, when it's feeling more confident, says that the North Korean military will be the vanguard of attempts to, uh, you know, roll back the South and uh, and reunify the Korean peninsula. Mm, right. So, what does Kim Jong-un then want in return for sending all these soldiers to Russia? Ah, oh, well, North Korea wants to modernise its military. It's reliant on some fairly old kit that wouldn't work well in a, a contemporary battlefield environment. It's fairly well known that that it doesn't have a particularly well modernised military. If that's the case, it makes its threats ring a little bit hollow. So we do anticipate that Russia will be helping the North Koreans in, in a variety of areas, particularly on military technology. And Russians are very good at missile technology. If Russian technology helps to give the North Koreans an ICBM, an intercontinental ballistic missile that can reach a long, long way, then that makes its threats about using nuclear weapons really, really very credible. Even more so, of course, if the Russians help the North Koreans out with things like submarine technology, with things like uh, you know low orbit nuclear weapons, which you know, would be uh, very much a game changer because it would make North Korean nukes very survivable. At the moment, there's only about 50 or so that probably could be taken out by the US or others if they wanted to. But to stick them on submarines, to have them on bombers, and then to have them in missile fields is, is something that is a different proposition for, for the American military. So, Matt, let's consider then the wider implications of this move. The relationship, of course, between Russia and North Korea has existed for a really long time, right back to the Korean War. So should we really be surprised by any of this? 
Well, look, I think we should be surprised, really, because uh, for many, many years, particularly after the Cold War, China became really the framework nation to, to deal with North Korea. It held the key to, to influencing Pyongyang because it provided the vast majority of the aid that North Korea received, whether that was food aid or whether that was assistance, you know, to some extent for its military. There were times uh, during the six-party talks over North Korean nuclear weapons where the Chinese would actually play a very sensible role and stop the aid shipments. You would see satellite imagery of trains on the Chinese side bound for North Korea not going. So now with the, the, the Russians coming into the equation, for one thing, it does almost displace China because China has viewed North Korea as its so-called little brother and this is potentially you know, not the best news for, for Chinese foreign policy makers. Mm. More than that, of course, because China played a, a fairly moderating influence on, on North Korea, the new relationship with Russia kind of frees the shackles a bit. And, and that's deeply worrying because mm. you've got Putin in Europe who's prepared to issue all sorts of threats and throw his military weight around and, and launch wars of invasion teaming up with, you know, a country that really is not averse to doing that as well. Mm, so China is an ally of North Korea, but this move could test that relationship, you think? Look, I think it could. When you see, you know, pictures of, uh, of Putin and Kim, you know, drinking wine and uh, having mutually self-congratulatory statements saying that, uh, that, that Russia is the closest friend of North Korea. That's, that's something that I don't think Beijing anticipated. And, uh, you know, it's, it's two countries here which need things that they haven't otherwise been getting. Now, Russia needs ammunition and it needs warm bodies to support the war in Ukraine. And, and North Korea wants its military to, uh, to have real teeth so that its, its threats, you know, have weight. Mm. Of course, the South Koreans are deeply concerned. North Korea's involvement in Russia's invasion is a violation of UN resolutions and should be condemned as an illegal act by the international community. Furthermore, it poses a serious threat to our national security and the safety of our people. What does it mean for the South Koreans, do you think? Well, the North Koreans uh, just in recent months have, uh, or recent weeks, have, have blown up all links to the South in a very, you know, public show that, you know, they're no longer interested in any form of, of cooperation. They're moving to a much more sort of muscular, aggressive, I think, posture with relation to the South. This is, is highly escalatory and mm. uh, as a result, there is a lot of speculation that the South Koreans will, in a sort of tit-for-tat move, get more heavily vol involved in the war in Ukraine. Mm. That doesn't mean sending troops necessarily, but it does potentially mean sending them large amounts of military hardware. And frankly, uh, South Korea is really the only country that's, that's sort of, I guess, aligned with the West that is producing enormous volumes of, of military hardware and, uh, and which Ukraine could badly use, I think. Mm, right, so it's clearly an escalation in the war. What will it mean for the war, though? Will it really assist Russia? Could it change the course of the conflict, do you think? Look, I don't think it changes the course of the conflict that much. While it won't turn the the outcome of the conflict, it's a symbol that Russia has friends. We tend to think of Russia as a pariah state that's cut adrift from the rest of the world through through its own actions. But no, you know, it does have friends. It has has friends amongst uh, you know some of the leaders that cause us the most concern. And North Korea is no exception. Yeah. And Matt, when new nations join wars, I guess that should be a worry for all of us. Absolutely. It means that those wars are, are escalating. So that makes it globally important. And frankly, it makes it important for Australia as well. Conflicts in Europe, conflicts in Asia uh, are no longer isolated to particular regions. It means they're bleeding into one another. Uh, and that has some significant implications for the way Australia goes about its, its foreign and security policy, just as it'll have significant implications for how Japan, the Philippines and, and other countries go about looking at security and, and strategy in the world. Matthew Sussex is an associate professor at the Centre for European Studies at the Australian National University. 
This episode was produced by Cara Jensen McKinnon and Sydney Peed. Audio production by Sam Dunn. Our supervising producer is David Cody. I'm Sam Hawley. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.